I was raised on a family dairy farm, milking cows, mowing and building hay, and doing all the rest of the stuff that typically happens on farms. But school was also very important to my father. He only had a couple years of formal education, so he wanted his children to have the opportunity to go to college. Instead of attending the local high school, he arranged for me to drive 102 miles per day for five years to attend a free and very prominent public high school in Washington, D.C. After earning my undergraduate degree in veterinary medicine, three years at Penn State, and one year at the University of Georgia Veterinary School, I eventually entered a graduate school at Cornell, where I completed master's and doctorate degrees in nutritional biochemistry. There, my doctoral research took for granted the superior health value of the typical United States diet of meat, milk, and eggs because of its content of high-quality protein from animal source food. In fact, my doctoral dissertation developed a study to improve the production of quote-unquote high-quality animal protein. After doing postdoctoral research in toxicology and nutrition at MIT, I accepted a faculty position at Virginia Tech teach about chemistry. While there, I was also invited to be coordinator of a U.S. State Department project in the Philippines designed to alleviate childhood malnutrition. In those days, many nutritionists and food policy experts assumed there was a so-called protein gap leading to a high prevalence of childhood malnutrition in less industrialized nations. One of our goals was directed to identifying low-cost sources of protein to be consumed by malnourished children. I didn't foresee any connection of protein with cancer, but that changed pretty quickly. One day, a surgeon friend, who was also the medical advisor to the President of the Philippines, happened to tell me how he and a colleague had been operating on very young children for primary liver cancer. This caught my attention. It seemed odd that children four years of age and younger could be suffering from a disease that usually is associated with middle and older age. Meanwhile, from our own data, I was beginning to get the impression that the few wealthiest families who consumed the most animal protein were the ones most likely to have children who got that same cancer. Clearly, something was wrong. More protein was supposed to be equal to better health, not favor cancer. Not long after that, I learned of a new experimental a study from India. The research of that study had a hypothesis that most nutrition researchers would have considered perfectly reasonable. They believed that after exposing experimental animals to a carcinogen, those consuming higher levels of protein would develop less cancer, and those fed lower levels of protein. In other words, protein was good and would help protect the body against the carcinogen. Their research results were striking suggesting the opposite of what they expected. More protein, more cancer. It was at this time, after being exposed to these provocative ideas, that I began my own experimental research program in my lab at Virginia Tech. Funded by the NIH and other taxpayer money for the next 30 plus years, my students and I investigated a number of questions. Was it true that high protein diets caused cancer, particularly liver cancer? How did it work? Was it biologically plausible? That is, what mechanisms accounted for this effect? Our research strongly supported the surprising effect of animal-based protein on promoting cancer. That led to studies in other nutrients, particularly studies comparing the biological effects of the protein from plants versus the protein from animals. My research included two tracks. The first was conducted in a laboratory investigating very basic biochemical activities of chemical carcinogens and nutrients and doing so in a very targeted way. The second track investigated whether these same effects existed in humans. Eventually, this led to a massive project in rural China, which some of you will know about, a project the New York Times called the Grand Prix of Epidemiology. As a result of these various studies, along with intensive personal participation in the development of national and international food and health policy, I was provided a perspective on nutrition that now is radically different from what, that which I began my career. It's been shaped and reshaped by more than six decades of research. 
with many students and colleagues. And it's a change in my perspectives on nutrition that I'm very excited to share with you.